Welcome to Making Bank. I am Josh Felber, where we uncover the mindset and success strategies of the top 1% so you can amplify your life and your business today. I'm super excited for today's guest. He's a serial entrepreneur and expert in remote hiring and e-commerce. He started his first business out of his college dorm room that sold over $30 million online. He is now the co-founder and CEO of FreeUp.com, a marketplace that connects businesses with pre-vetted freelancers in the e-commerce and digital marketing and many more areas. He also regularly appears on leading podcasts such as Entrepreneur on Fire and speaks at live events on, about online hiring tactics. I'm excited today to welcome Nathan Hirsch to Making Bank. Welcome to the show. Josh, thanks for having me. I'm pumped to be here. For sure. Dude, like your background's super cool, you know, just with the whole thing about starting your business out of your college dorm room and, you know, just, you know, now with where you are today and I know I want to definitely dive in and kind of pick your brain more about the freelancers and everything because we work with some of those and, you know, how we can use that better and leverage that better in our business and everything. And so I kind of like to dive in a little bit initially how you got started. You know, were you an entrepreneur before the whole co college dorm room thing or was that kind of your first entrepreneurial venture? Yeah. So my parents were both teachers. So growing up, I kind of had the mentality, get good grades in high school, go to college, good grades, get a job, work for 40 years. And what, when I was in high school, I always had a summer job while everyone else was out playing. I was working 40, 50 hours a week but gained some really good experiences at the Aarons Corporation, Firestone. But I also realized that I hated it. I hated looking at the clock every day. I, I, that was when I first realized that if I wanted to not be miserable the rest of my life, I had to start my own business. So when I got to college and I was picking a major, I remember the, the teacher that had just started an entrepreneur program got up in front of class and she said, if you ever want financial and life freedom, you have to be an entrepreneur. It's the only way. And that really resonated with me. So I got to work hustling and I tried every little thing just to make money on the side. I really wanted to quit these jobs I had that I was working on the side, even going into college. So I started off buying and selling people's textbooks. I created a, a little referral program. Um, and before I knew it, I had lines out the door of people trying to sell me their books to the point where I actually got a cease and desist letter from my college bookstore because I was taking up so much of their business. So that was my first glimpse into being an entrepreneur. And books led me to Amazon because you don't sell books for very long without learning about Amazon. And I became addicted to it. I, I thought it was so cool. This was years before all the courses and the gurus were out there. People had no idea what Amazon even was. And I kind of looked at my situation. I, I didn't have a warehouse. I didn't have a lot of capital. So I came up with the concept of drop shipping years before I even knew it was called drop shipping. The idea that I could sell someone else's product, sell it to a, a customer and get it shipped without actually touching the product and just make the difference as my margin. So I had the concept and I started playing around a little bit with stuff I was familiar with, sporting equipment, computers, video games, and I just failed over and over again. The only thing that I could get to sell were these books. So I'm freaking out a little bit because I realize I'm going to graduate at some point. I'm not going to have books around me forever. And I'm, I have these real life jobs staring me down the throat. So I started experimenting outside my comfort zone. And when I found the baby product niche, that's when the business really started to take off. So people had no idea what I was doing. I was sitting in the back of class listing baby products on Amazon. People thought I was crazy. And I mean, I was a 20 year old single college guy selling millions of dollars worth of baby products on Amazon. So this business is growing and it's my first taste of e-commerce and I meet with an accountant. It's time to start paying taxes because I'm making money now. And he says, when are you going to hire your first person? And I kind of shrugged him off. I'm like, why would I do that? The money's going into my pocket. No one can do it as well as I can, blah, 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 excuses. And he kind of just laughed in my face and said, you're going to figure out this lesson on your own. So my first busy season comes around and I get destroyed. I'm working 20 hours a week. I'm balancing school. I, I lose my girlfriend. I, my social life is gone. And somehow I make it up, make it out to January and I think, okay, I can never let this happen again. I have to start hiring people. 
but who am I going to hire? The the college kids around me weren't very reliable. No 30-year-old wanted to come work for some 20-year-old rookie entrepreneur. So I really got thrown into that remote hiring world, the Upworks, the Fivers, and I started hiring freelancers. And I got pretty good at it. And eventually, as I grew this and I left college and I moved to Florida and I actually opened up an office, I got sick of how long it would take me to go on Upwork and post a job and get 100 applicants. So that's really when I had the concept of building my own marketplace free up, which I'm sure we'll talk about. So that's kind of how I went from a broke college kid to starting two companies. <laughs> no, that's awesome, man. And that's, I love the story just, you know, with the whole fact of, you know, being able to, you know, while you were in college and figuring stuff out, you know, along the way. And I think, you know, a couple of key points that you mentioned was the whole fact that, you know, you can, after every, you know, trying the different products and failing and failing, you know, you kept moving forward, you know, with that and, you know, that had that, oh man, okay, just cause this didn't work. I'm not giving up already. What, um, I guess, what did you learn kind of during that time frame? you know, when you were failing over and over? Yeah. I mean, first of all, I had to stop caring what other people thought about me really quick. I mean, people thought I was running a scam. People didn't understand why I was selling baby products. I, I had to eliminate that, but I also had to just figure out what worked. I mean, there was no one that really understood the e-commerce industry. And I've never, even now when I'm building free up, I, I tend to not follow the gurus in the courses, not that they don't have valuable information, but Part of the fun for me is figuring out on my own. That's part of the, what I like about being an entrepreneur. So just putting time into those low risk, high reward situations where if you fail, you're, you're not homeless. And if you succeed, it, it opens up a, a, a big opportunity. That's really how I focus my time. Cool. And and I know, you know, you mentioned that, you know, with that is uh, you got out of your comfort zone. So, you you know, things that you liked, you were trying, but weren't working and, you know, all of a sudden you don't have kids or anything, but you're like, oh, let me try baby products. And, you know, and then, you know, that's what, you know, kind of what hit that home run for you. What, um, you know, I guess what uh, did you, you know, you, as you were thinking and kind of trying to get out of your comfort zone, how did the whole baby products piece come into the play there? Like wh what made you like, oh, baby products? I mean, it, it was all experimenting and reading the market. And I feel like too many people, they have this five, 10 year plan for their business when they haven't gotten any feedback. They haven't even seen it if they can sell their product yet. And very similar to how we started free up, we started off with this very basic concept and we kind of let it go in whatever direction the feedback in the market was telling us. If, if people had said, hey, we only want Filipino VAs, we'd probably be just an outsourcing company. But we kind of realized the opportunity for US freelancers, non-US, Amazon digital marketing, and we continue to read that market and ask for feedback. I mean, if I had listed, sorry about that, if I had listed um, any any product up there and it wasn't starting to sell, I was immediately trying something else. I wasn't just forcing it because I wanted it to sell. Sure. And then, you know, I guess back then, you know, obviously you were teaching yourself and going along the way, you know, how did you measure your success, especially on Amazon, you know, back then? It just, you knew in two or three days if it wasn't selling, it wasn't going to sell or, you know, what did you do? Yeah, it, it became all about creating systems and processes because you're, you create a system for finding these products and then you create a system for monitoring these products. So if a new competitor comes out, hey, how do we tweak this price to be lower? How do we see what they're doing well and try to get our own products up? And then also the process for filling orders and keeping track of how much you're making and and all this and reaching out to new manufacturers eventually. So it turned into from experimenting to, OK, we have something now. Now let's turn the, that pro, that business into different systems and processes. Right. Yeah. No, and that's definitely key, you know, is being able to go to that next level, you know, and start to create those systems and processes. Cause you know, I know just, you know, even, I mean, you know, our company will do eight figures this year and you know, it's like, you got to have that. Cause if not, you start to see the little cracks happen and then they become bigger and bigger and bigger. And all of a sudden you have this avalanche. You're like, where did this come from? <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but, um, okay. So that kind of led you to the whole thing with, you know, creating a whole outsourcer program just due to the fact that it was a need for you and a need, you know, and you were like, okay, I got to figure out a better way to do this. Did you, uh, your other business and did you sell, did you sell that? Do you still have that going? You know, what's that whole piece? So there are three partners in that business. We actually ran it through the end of last year and free up has taken off. So we moved that business over to the one partner and the two of us are, are completely focused on free up. Okay. And then 
with uh, FreeUp, then that is, so how is that different than, like you said, I guess, like an outsourcing company? Yeah. So what I've used every marketplace out there. And what I tried to do was take what I liked about them and tweak or change what I didn't like. So what we do is we get hundreds of applicants every week, freelancers from around the world. We vet them for skill, attitude, communication, take the top 1%, let them in, and then make them available to people quickly whenever they need them. We fill requests within a business day. And then we added 24 seven support on the back end. So people always get instant responses, no matter how big or small their need is, because we both know if you're an entrepreneur, time is everything. And then we also added a no turnover guarantee because we both know how frustrating it is to find someone you like, invest money and time into them and have them walk out the door. So rarely happens with us, but if it does, we cover all replacement costs and get you a new person right away. So that's really how we made ourselves different, that pre-vetting, the speed, the customer service, and that protection. No, that's awesome because you see the different outsourcing companies popping up, but then they all have that same feel, that same thing, you know, with them. And, you know, it is, it's whether it's, you know, we've used different services like you mentioned, um, you know, and some other direct ones with, you know, like the Filipino ones and things like that. And it's always hard to vet them and to screen them and, okay, cool, this looks great, but oh, this is horrible over here. Or, you know, they all look great on paper and they sound good. And then when it's time to work, you're like, what are you doing? What's 40 hours a week that you're doing? <laughs> exactly. So. And I think that was the first reaction we got. Oh, great, another VA company. And it was up to us to, to really prove to people how we were different and that they would get a better experience. Awesome. So what, um, what would you say, I guess, are the top three things for a company, you know, when they're looking, you know, to find a VA, um, you know, we'll start with that. Then I got some other questions down that same path. So I think one of the biggest mistakes people make is they're not hiring the right level of freelancer. So I like to say that there's three levels, basic, mid and expert. So a basic level freelancer, non us five to 10 bucks an hour, they might have years of experience, but they're there to follow your system, your process that you have in place where a mid-level person is more specialized, that 10 to 30 range, bookkeeper, graphic designer, writer, you're not teaching them how to design, but they're not consulting with you either, they're doers. And then you got the experts, the 25 and up, that can consult, project manage, audit your business, help create the systems and processes. And I feel like a lot of times where people go wrong is they're hiring that $5 an hour person and they're like, hey, find me clients. <laughs> and it's like, no, you need you need, either need a system for it or you need an expert to come in and come up with a marketing strategy. And um, that, that's probably the first way. The second is just not setting expectations up front, um, getting on the same page, getting everything in writing, which if you don't do leads to a lot of he said, she said and issues down the line. And I think the last thing is just diversifying. I mean, I had a situation where I spent six months training an employee back in my Amazon business and I had one manufacturer that I was working with and crushing it with them. I didn't bother to get another. I go on my first vacation, first day of vacation, manufacturer quits, employee quits. <laughs> so it, it, if you put all your eggs in one basket, you're, you're subjecting yourself to that kind of risk. But I'm really happy I learned that lesson early on and really departmentalized going forward. Okay. And so with, do you guys, uh, so how you were talking about setting the expectations, making sure, you know, they know what they're doing and all that. Is that something then you work with the company on that's looking for, you know, an assistant on that? So we're a marketplace. You're dealing with the freelancer directly. We post a lot of content on our YouTube channel and our blog and we're there to help you. Um, but we can't force clients to do anything they don't want to do, you know? Sure. Yeah, no, I wasn't sure if, if you guys were more like involved in the process or, but it sounds like then it's just that direct link and, you know, and then you link them with the people that you guys already have pre-vetted and kind of cleared under what your great greatness umbrella is. Yeah. And we have best practices that the freelancers are expected to follow that avoids a lot of those issues before they even happen. Um, but a lot of all the work is between the client and the freelancer directly. Gotcha. Okay, cool. And so, um, so say you have, um, like, for example, I have my podcast and I outsource a lot of the pieces of it and everything. Would then in your marketplace and you kind of how you talked about the basic, the mid and the expert, then, you know, would you say, OK, cool. What which one of those levels then would you have? Like, would you say, OK, we want to have a project manager for overseeing to make sure all these tasks and everything get done of the systems and processes that are already in place? Would that be that expert level then or? 
Yeah, I mean, keep in mind these are real people, and they don't always fall into perfect levels. Um, yes, probably it's the expert, but I mean, we we have great project managers that are Filipino, and they might be in that eight to fifteen dollar an hour range. So it's not a hundred percent set in stone, but it's a good baseline. So people say, "Hey, I have stuff I need to get off my plate. I can't hire that person who needs a system and process to follow unless I have that system in place." Gotcha. Okay, no, that makes sense. So, um, <clears throat> so you kind of talked about some of the different things like what businesses should look for when, you know, hiring a VA. Um, what, uh, so, you know, we dive into your marketplace, you know, we're looking for one, I guess, what are the challenges that we may run into, um, you know, when we hire a VA and what should we have, I guess, ready up front before we bring on a VA? Yeah, the biggest thing is communication that goes both ways. So I've seen plenty of people do what I consider is a huge waste of time during interviews. If you need someone, let's say, to work Saturday morning, so that's a very basic example, that should be the first thing you ask them during the interview question. And it, the last thing you wanna do is spend 30 minutes talking with someone and at the end, oh, by the way, can you work the schedule I need? No, I can't, and that time's out the window. And a lot of the times, if you put that in the request up front, we're only gonna introduce you to someone that can work on that time that you want but you have to come up with up front and really define what your perfect person looks like because if you don't know what your perfect person looks like, there's no way that me and my team know what that perfect person sure. looks like. Okay. Um, so yeah, definitely defining you know what they look like and that. Then um, I know one of the things that you know is should you already then have all your I guess job role outline for them? Should you have those kind of a things so you're not when they after you do hire them you don't have that lag time? Yeah, if you're new to hiring, I definitely recommend that job post. I, I think once, w that detailed job post, I think once you get more advanced and, and kind of how I hire is, I kind of adjust people's roles to their strengths. So I can have a loose job post, but I set the expectations up front. And then as I see it, them develop, then I quickly adjust it and figure out where they need to fit. But I wasn't able to do that the first year I was hiring people. It's a little bit, it's a little bit more advanced. Sure, awesome. Uh, and then what, um for, I guess you're, you know, you get, you had a great successful e-com company, you know, you're, you know, rapidly growing, um, you're, uh, out, you know, you're outsourcing marketplace and everything. Now, what, um, have you found has been the most successful, you know, for you along this journey? Yeah. So we talked about those low risk, high reward stuff. I mean, being on podcasts has been huge. I, just being on podcasts and getting in front of different business communities. And, and I would even say setting up a referral program. I mean, any clients that come from other clients get 50 cents for every hour. We build that client forever. And we don't just say it. We advertise it everywhere. It's in our newsletter. It's on our website. People know about it. Influencers want to partner with us because of it. And it's probably one of the better business decisions that we've made early on. I mean, we paid out over $150,000 last year in referral money, which is a lot of 50 cents per hour. So, so if you if you find stuff like that, which encourages people to get you new business and anything that you can do to systemize it and make it a real process that people take seriously, I think that is a key to growing your business, especially if you're bootstrapping like I am. Cool. Um, and I guess for you know your you know business marketplace out there somebody like you were initially thinking okay should i hire somebody you know what should i do what would you say the top 3 things are people should say okay these th these are the top 3 things that you need to outsource right away yeah, and keep in mind, I didn't just wake up one day and hire 40 people. I figured out, how do I how do I get hours in my day back? What's taking up the most time? Can I get five hours this week back, 10 hours next week? So what I did was I came up with a list of everything I did on a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month basis, and started it started off with emails and data entry and bookkeeping and customer service. I mean, all that stuff kind of falls into that, and those are the things that I took off my plate early on just to allow me to focus my time on higher level activities. But the flip side of it, and one of the best activities that my business partner and I do pretty regularly, is we sit down and we say, hey, what are you good at? What are you bad at? And we're brutally honest with each other. And at the end, we always realize that we complement each other very well, which is great, but we always have this list of things that both of us are not good at, yet we're doing them every single week. So what we do is we hire people to turn those weaknesses into strengths and take those off our plate. And that's how you really accelerate your business. Mm, yeah, no, that's, I think that's some awesome, you know, advice. I mean, it's so common sense somewhat, but it's like nobody does it. 
You know, it's just, it's, just, we, okay, we look at, yeah, what are we good at? What are we not good at? But then it's all right, well, let's find somebody to fulfill, you know, those other areas. Um, I know uh, some, one of the guys I've interviewed before, he had mentioned too, like they, had, like, they like to have a lot of people on their team, uh, like in house, but then each person that's a, a project manager or something like that has like a VA that helps them all the time. Is that kind of something you suggest as you're growing to, to set up and do then? So when I opened up an office for my Amazon business, which is one of the worst business decisions I ever made, um, when we had people there, we did the same thing. Our, every every employee in the office had at least one assistant. Some of them had five, and I definitely encourage that. And now that I've gone back to entirely remote and free ups 100% remote, and all the internal team is entirely remote, we do the same thing. I mean, we have leaders for our billing team, leaders for our recruitment team, leaders for my assistants, and then they have assistants underneath them. So I mean, the gig economy is booming. You can. Get Get creative now with what you are what you're able to do that you weren't able to do 10 years ago no that's cool what um, we got a few minutes left what would you say um, I guess you want to leave everybody with like hey you know this is something that you must start doing today to move your business forward yeah, I mean, the thing to keep in mind is there's very few $5 million a year solo businesses. At some point, you're going to have to start hiring. So the sooner that you can plan out your next hires or plan out your next five hires, but be willing to adjust going forward, the better. You should have a good idea of, hey, over the next four weeks, I'm going to add X amount of people to my team to do X, Y, Z. And I think that that little planning up front, you don't even have to go too far ahead, is going to set you up for success in the future because one of two things is going to happen if you don't. You're either going to hit a wall and not be able to scale further, or you're going to get so pumped into that day-to-day -day operations that it's going to become incredibly hard for you to get out of it without hurting your business in some way. Uh, no, that's definitely great insight because, you know, it's I think along the whole journey, we're just so we get so tunnel focused and you're like, OK, you know, where am I going? How am I going to get there? And you think you, you forget about the whole, OK, you know, I got to hire somebody. I got to do this. And you know, and it just whereas if we kind of take a step back, look at it, like you said, and figure out, OK, cool. Who can I put in place right now today, you know, to give me back some time to then allow me to do those other things that are going to generate revenue or do X, Y, Z to take, you know, take what I'm doing today for my business, you know, to move it forward. So definitely some great insight there. Um, where can people find out about you and, you know, kind of anything that, you know, you want to leave them with there? Yeah. So if you go to freeup.com with three E's, my calendar is right at the top. You can book a free time with me. I'd love to talk to you about your business. If you create an account to hire people, mention this podcast, get a free $25 credit to try us out. And me and my team are there to help you along the way. Cool. And uh, I think that's it, man. Any last insights? No, I appreciate you having me. I had a lot of fun. Awesome, Nathan. It was great having you, you know, really starting to understand what make, made you successful as well as some of the different tools and things people can utilize uh, and just insights to hiring, utilizing VAs to excel and move their business forward. So guys, hope you guys were taking notes. If not, go back, rewind, watch this, listen to this again, and go check out Nathan's company, Free Up, to move your business forward today, to find that right VA, to find that right person that's going to help you buy back your time, to get your time back today. So thanks again, Nathan, for coming on Making Bank, and really appreciate your time today. Thanks, Josh. I am Josh Felber. You are watching Making Bank. Get out and be extraordinary.